Will Rogers tells the story about a boy in the West that had a, an owl he was very proud of and thought it was a tough owl. He went around the little town saying, my owl can beat any fowl. There's no fowl that my owl can't whip. And there was also another boy in town who heard about that who had a rooster. And when he heard that, he went around saying, my uh, rooster can beat any fowl. There's no fowl that my rooster can't whip. They met in the town square and they duked it out. The owl was a tough looking creature but he just stood there lock, stock, and still and never reacted while the rooster flogged him to death. And the little boy with the rooster walked away and said, he died thinking about it, didn't he? There's a time to think, there's a time to act. God has appealed to us in so many different ways, and he wants us to realize how much he wants us to act in response to his grace and his love. We're gonna look at some hills that God has placed between a person and being lost. I hope you'll join us for a few moments as we explore that important topic today. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus says in a specific way what the rest of the New Testament says in a rather general way. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and few there be that find it. While those words, Neil, are familiar to us, Jesus says them specifically here, but the New Testament, the rest of it, bears the same idea out, doesn't it? It does. You know, in this very solemn statement of our Savior, we learn some very fundamental truths. The first thing we learn is that life has but two roadways. You, know, you see it depicted there. Jesus speaks of the uh, broad way and the wide gate. That's roadway number one. And he speaks of the narrow gate and the narrow way and the, the straight gate. That's roadway number two. As far as our Lord is concerned, these are the only two roadways in life. So we have to choose one of those. We're either going wide or broad, but there's no third lane. There's no third option. This is one of those old school roads with just two directions to travel, and every one of us is going one of those ways. That's right. I mean, here in America, we speak of the upper class and the middle class and the lower class. But you'll see here that Jesus speaks of only two classes of humanity. You know, men that are saved, men that are lost, men on the broad way and men on the narrow way. In Matthew 25, 31 through 34, Jesus says all nations will be gathered before him and he'll be, will be on one hand or the other. You know, when the Titanic went down, they made two lists, those that survived and those that didn't. And according to our Lord on that last day, all of us are going to be in one of two lists. We'll either be right with God or we'll not be right with Him. We'll either be saved or we'll be lost. And so etern the life has only two roadways. So this passage, and as you mentioned, the rest of the New Testament gives us some major principles. One is that there's two, there are two ways, but what else does this passage give us? Well, it, it reveals the idea that eternity has but two dwelling places. You know, that straight gate and that narrow way leads to eternal life. That wide gate and that broad way leads to eternal destruction. Our Lord is dealing with heaven and hell, everlasting life and everlasting destruction. We'll either uh, go to heaven where there's absolute joy, there's peace, there's the fellowship with God and the saints of all the ages, or we're gonna dwell in hell where there's uh, pain, where there's no hope, where there's darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of te teeth. And so Jesus here reveals to us not only that life has two roadways, but eternity has only two dwelling places. I think it's impressive that in this sermon with all of these blessings, he begins with the Beatitudes and he talks about God wanting to provide for us in Matthew chapter six. But then when he gets here in seven, 13 and 14, he's saying, you, what you do with this information makes a difference because there are only gonna be two options at the end. So there are two directions we can travel. We can be on the narrow road or the, the wide. We can go to either heaven or hell. But what else from Jesus in Matthew 7, 13 and 14 is born out in the rest of the New Testament here? Perhaps the most startling part of this statement of all is that more are going to hell than are going to heaven. You'll notice that our Lord doesn't deal in any numbers, but he uses two words. When he refers to those who are going to be lost, he says many. And when he refers to those who are gonna be saved, he says few. I don't know how many our Lord had in mind when he says many there be that go in there at. And I don't know how many our Lord had in mind when he said few there be that find it, but when he deals with those that are saved and those that are lost, he tells us that more are going to be lost than are going to be saved. And to me, it's a startling thing that more would be lost than are going to be saved. If heaven is so wonderful,
and hell is so terrible, why would more be lost than are saved? But see, men run toward the devil as if he were God and run from God as if he were the devil. They run toward sin as if it were righteousness and run from righteousness as if it were sin. They run uh, toward hell as if it were heaven and run toward he- away from heaven as if it were hell. It's an insane age in which we live. And Jesus says that that's the way it is in every generation. More are going to hell than are going to heaven. Isaiah talks about us mixing up our choices. In Isaiah 5 and verse 20, he says that there are some that change light for darkness, darkness for light, sweet for bitter, bitter for sweet, But in the end, Jesus says there are more people. Now this doesn't make heaven some small chess club of a few, but in relation to everybody who has ever lived, there are more people choosing the wrong way than choosing the right. That's right. But this isn't what God wants, surely. God doesn't want it to be this way. It's the reality of what Jesus says, but hasn't heaven done some things to help us go the narrow way, to help us go the heavenly way, to help us go down that right road that'll end in eternal bliss rather than an eternal horror? Absolutely. I love the way Peter sets up, um, again, some very graphic material about what the end is going to be like. But before he talks about the demise of this earth, he sets it up by saying that the Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some men count that slowness, uh, but is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mm -hmm. God has made it clear in his word that he doesn't want any of us to be lost, but more than that, that if we're going to be lost, it's really not something that is going to be easy. You know, you and I have been uh, running this week, and we've been running uh, over some pretty pronounced hills. And uh, it's easier to run on flat ground and a little easier to run downhill, but it's hard to run over those hills. And I think when we look at all of Scripture, God has it kind of depicted for us in that way, that it's difficult. He's put barriers between us and being lost because he wants us to be saved. And each of these that we look at will be proof positive that God would love everybody to be on the Lord's right hand at the judgment. So what you're saying is these heels are things that God has put in place to keep us from being lost and that we'd have to do a lot of work. It's gonna take a lot of effort to run around or run over or climb over all of these various, we'll just call them safety nets, these hills that God's put there to keep us from being lost. And so this is actually good news for us that Mm -hmm. God has done these things and placed these various hills in our way with running, it's not so fun. Mm -hmm. But when you think about heaven, it's a great thing that God desperately wants us to be saved. So he's put these hills in place. So what are some of the hills that God's placed in front of us? Okay, and in no particular order, let's just think about some of those. The first one would be gospel preaching. From the dawn of time, God has engaged in gospel preaching to save humanity. You know, Peter looks back on Noah in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, and he calls him a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2 and verse 5. Uh, in the time of the prophets, you think about Jonah in Jonah 3 and verse 2 when he gets his reboot and he has a second chance to go to Nineveh. God says, Arise, go to Nineveh, and there preach the preaching that I bid you. And so in the Old Testament, we see how preaching plays such an important part. And we see the prophets often synonymous in their work, in the work of preaching. Yeah, you think about Old Testament characters. You think about a man like Enoch. It says he walks with God in Genesis 5, 24, but in the book of Jude, verses 14 through 16, it says Enoch preached and he warned the generation about the wrath to come. It was an ungodly time, but God wasn't laughing about that. He was sending out a herald to hopefully change their way, or Jeremiah 1, 9 through 11. It says in the days of Jeremiah, God commissioned him in the midst of wicked Judah to plant, to pull up, to put things in the right order and to root down and make sure that they heard the message from God that would hopefully steer them in the right direction. So preaching has a long history and heritage from God's standpoint is being used as a tool from God to keep individuals from going the wrong way. Right, and so consistently we get to the New Testament and we see John the Baptist coming in the wilderness of Judea and preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, uh, Matthew 3 and verse 2. After Jesus' baptism, uh, we have him in, as, after his temptation beginning his ministry in Matthew four seventeen, and he's preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in much of his ministry, you see how it centers around preaching. In Luke chapter 10, you have the limited commission where 70 are sent unto the lost of the household of Israel and they're sent preaching. And then of course, after Jesus is raised from the dead and he's about to go to heaven, he gives in Matthew, Mark, and Luke the great commission 
and he's sending them out to preach to the entire world. It's kind of like a good school teacher who says, I want everybody to pass this class. So I'm gonna give you lectures, I'm gonna give you study guides, I'll be available for after school tutoring, I'm gonna give you homework assignments, all of this material, so that if you fail the class, you had to work really hard to do so because there's been this abundance of information. And God says through preaching, proclamation, the teaching of his word down through history, up to the present time and continuing on even now, God has said, I've given you these messages so that you won't miss it. I've given you these messages so that you will hear and hopefully take heed and be saved. Right, so we're not surprised when we get the epistles after the church is established and we find great passages like 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of the message preached to save those that believe. Or God has manifested his word through preaching, Titus chapter one in verse three. I want us to think about how gospel preaching, true New Testament gospel preaching, doesn't leave us the same. I don't know, as I think about those who are with us today, how many Bible classes that we've been a part of and how many sermons that we've heard. But if we were to die lost, we'd have to say no to every Bible class we've ever been a part of and every sermon that we've heard preached. You know, it doesn't leave us the same. There's an old saying that says, the same sun that melts the butter hardens the clay, and the Word of God will melt one man's heart and will harden another. If we're going to die lost, we're going to have to say no to gospel preaching in order to be lost. So one of the hills that we've got to get over, if we're going to be lost, we're going to have to run around gospel preaching sermons from the Bible, sermons we've heard, classes and things we've been a part of. And so God's given us instruction to keep us from demise, but it's not just gospel preaching, is it? No, and you think, and uh, the Bible tells us that God has given us the hill of the church. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, the apostle Paul calls the church the pillar and support of the truth. And we, we realize that the church was in the heart and the mind of God before man was formed from the dust of the ground. In Ephesians 3, 9 through 11, we see this idea of the eternal purpose of God being worked out through the church. And so God has established the church as a barrier between us and being lost. You know in the Old Testament, book of Joshua, chapter 20, there were these cities of refuge. And if a man found himself in danger, he, accidental manslaughter, he could run to one of these cities of refuge and there be safe from destruction. And the church is also the city of refuge in the world of sin and wickedness. And we could, we can run to the family of God and be in God's house after we become Christians. And God puts us there for our protection. God puts us there so we'd be surrounded by people that love the Lord, that are gonna encourage us to do right, and they're gonna point us in the right direction. And so the church serves as this divine city of refuge, but we'd have to turn in our citizenship and run in the other direction based on what you're telling us if we're going to avoid this heel that God's put in place to say, I really want you to be saved and do the right thing. That's right, and, and I wanna say a word about the congregation that you and I uh, work with, the Lehman Avenue Church of Christ. Obviously, no, none of us are perfect and all of us are striving to be more like Jesus and at times we're gonna disappoint, but I would have to say on the whole that I don't know that I have known of a, a church that is trying to do more to reach those who need to come to Christ than the Lehman Avenue Church of Christ. And really, anytime anyone who's a part of his church invites someone to be a part of the church, to study or to attend services, every time that we pray for someone, every time we try to meet the needs of others, we try to be an example, we're saying to those that are lost, if you're going to be lost, you're gonna to have to climb over us to do it. Now, I've known some churches through the years that weren't evangelistic, they weren't living right, they weren't loving, and you'd have to climb over them in order to get to God. But I'd have to say, I believe that Lehman Avenue Church of Christ is striving to be a church that folks would have to climb over in order to be lost. So you think about the people that make up that church, Lehman Avenue where we worship and serve, but any congregation, there are elders and deacons and Bible class teachers and other servants that come alongside and help and serve. And what, what are they trying to do but point us on the right direction and basically form this wall that says, you know, you, you're not gonna be able to run past us to be lost. Now we can choose to do that, but it's a hill that God's put there that maybe our thought process would be changed and we'll decide to go in the right direction. That's exactly right. You know, so we think about hills that God has placed between us and being lost. We think about preaching. That's His commission. It's His design. We think about the church, which was also His commission and His design. 
Another significant hill between us and being lost is the hill of the Bible. Hmm. You know, um, I'll be the first to admit that there are some things that are difficult in the Bible to understand. Peter said as much, right? In 2 Peter 3.16, after discussing the second coming of Christ, he says, as in also in some of Paul's epistles, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they, which are unstable and unlearned, twist as they do the rest of the Scripture to their own destruction. And I've often wondered, what did Peter have in mind from Paul's hand? Mm. Maybe it's some of the sections of Romans, or yeah. maybe it's individual verses at Paul's hand. You know, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 29, and the baptism of the dead, I think I understand the illustration, but there's some difficulties involved in that. You recently taught Revelation, Revelation 20 and verse 3 and others. There's, there are some difficult passages in the Bible. That's right. And maybe somebody hears that and they say, well, that's exactly right, and that's why I stay away. But the Bible has some difficult parts, but those things that pertain to our salvation, being in a right relationship with God, how to live a godly life to bear the fruit of the Spirit, wouldn't you say those things, wouldn't you say those things are given to us in terms that can be readily understood from an early age? There are passages in the Bible, by and large, that are easy to digest and to take down, and that God's communicated those things in simple terms so that we might know His Word and know His will. That's right. I mean, for those exceptions that we mentioned, there's so much of the Bible that all of us can understand. And let me let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> there are three places in the New Testament that give us the great commission of Jesus. After he's uh, resurrected, before he mm -hmm. goes back to heaven, he assembles his apostles and he gives the marching orders for all of his followers there. And it's interesting those emphases that he makes. For example, you go to Mark's gospel. And in Mark 16 and verse 16, he says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He emphasizes belief. You go to Luke's gospel in Luke 24, verse 46 uh, through 49, and he says that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, beginning in Jerusalem and to all the world. He emphasizes repentance. And anything about Matthew's gospel in Matthew 28 and verse 19, he says uh, to preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So you have three emphases here, belief, repentance, and baptism. Now, a person may not know very much about the Bible, but if he knows those three conditions, he knows enough to be a Christian. So the Bible gives us that information, and the Bible is being given to us so that we can understand it. What we need to do to become a Christian isn't tucked in some obscure passage. God's made that plain and clear to us. We've got so much access to the Bible today that we really ought to capitalize on it and we avoid it to our own spiritual demise. But God's given us his word in various translations so that we can read it and know it and ultimately avoid the jumping over that hill and being lost. That's right. I mean, on the day of Pentecost, those same three conditions were preached for the first time. 3,000 people embraced that and gladly received the word and were baptized. Now, it may take some effort on our part to grow in our knowledge, but God has placed the Word of God as a barrier between us and being lost. And, you know, I think about the, the wonderful blessing that we can take for granted in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, here in America, most people have at least one Bible, even folks that don't go to church. M many of us have access in our own home to multiple copies of the Bible. And with the internet, it is so accessible like never before. But in lots of parts of the world, uh, it's not as freely accessible as we have it. In fact, often I hear from people overseas, and one of the most common things I hear from them is, can you get us more Bibles? You know, if we go through life not knowing God's will for us and God's plan of salvation and what our, uh, our future is, it's because we have turned our head from God's written revelation. He has placed His Word, the Bible, as a hill on the roadway to hell. And so God has given us the Word of God. Think about how many people have given their lives to translate the Bible and to preserve it down through time and sacrifice it so that we can have it in our own mother tongue to learn it, to be able to commit it to memory. If we've got a cell phone, we've got access to so many copies and various things but we'd have to do a lot of work to just get around it. We, got, we have verses sometimes posted on billboards, all these things God has done to say, I wanna hear from, I wanna speak to you, my message is for you, don't climb over this hill. But what else does God give us so that we might have a barricade or a hill to keep us from eternal damnation? God has given us our common sense as a hill between us and being lost. You know, all of us have at least a little of that, uh, that common sense that God has placed within us. Uh, 
And Jesus appeals to that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. After all that he said, he gets to the very end, and he says, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who uh, hears my sayings and he does them. You know, the, the rains are going to come, the winds are going to blow, the floods are going to ar arise, but they're going to be able to stand if they are built upon the rock, and that's the one who hears and who does. And he says, if you hear these sayings of mine and you don't do them, you're like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand, and the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So what he's doing here is he is appealing to our common sense. He is saying it is common sense to build your house upon a rock. It's common sense for you to be able to hear these sayings of mine and to do them. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, Israel is not on their best behavior in the first part of the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. God believes we can reason or he wouldn't offer that invitation. You think about Jesus teaching in these parables and he's teaching in a way that people can understand it and he would often leave them to evaluate. Which one of these do you think was the right thing? And hoping and realizing we've been created as rational beings with a moral compass and common sense to choose rightly and to just look at these two options before us and go in the right direction. That's right. Can, can you imagine being at the judgment day and perhaps you're standing next to somebody from another nation and that person says to you, I'm not prepared for this day. I know mm. nothing about it. I've not ever had a Bible. I've never heard the gospel preached. I didn't know a thing about it. It has to turn to you and you were to have to say, I'm not prepared for this day either. And he were to say, well, where are you from? And you were to say, I'm from America. And for him to say, you mean you're from America, a land of Bibles? You've heard the gospel preached? And you say, yes, I knew the way to salvation. I had God's word, but I didn't do a thing about it. Mm -hmm. One would be insensible standing before God, having spurned so many wonderful opportunities. The worst place on the whole globe from which to die lost is here in America because we've been uniquely blessed and maybe we have access to the Bible like no other nation before us. And so God says, I've given you common sense. And what does that common sense lead us to do? Or what should it lead us to do? Well, common sense says do what you know is right. If you're in a house and that house is on fire, maybe you're not aware of it, and somebody comes in and says, you need to get out of here. Your house is on fire. Common sense says to leave. Hmm. You know, common sense says build your house upon a rock. Common sense says uh, read God's Word and do it. Your common sense is going to say, do what you know is right. It's also going to say, do what you know is right right now. If you're in the water and you're like me and you can't swim very well and somebody comes along and they throw out a life preserver, you know, it doesn't make sense to say, oh, I, I, maybe I'll get to that here in about 10, 15 minutes. No, you're, you're going to want to do what's right right now. That fire illustration that I gave, you're going to run out of the house right then. You're not going to just deliberate on it. God has given us our common sense as a hill between us and being lost. You think about Saul in 1 Samuel 26, and he's chasing David and doing all sorts of foolish things, and he eventually says, I played the fool. He's done foolish things. He should have chosen to be wiser. Jesus told his disciples, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them, John 13, 17. And That's what right. you're saying is God's given us common sense so that we might say, well, I know what's right, and I need to do what's right, and I need to do what's right right now. But what else? God has also given us the hill of our family. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul is talking to men there, uh, to families, and he's saying, if any man provides not for his own, especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And I know in context he's talking about physical assistance, but surely hmm. spiritual assistance is implied. That's right. We need to provide everything our families need. That's not just bread and butter, but that also would be pointing them in the direction of faith and trusting in God. And God has blessed us with families in a way. Psalm 127 talks about the Lord building the house for us and shooting our children as arrows in the right direction and there being a rich heritage for individuals who do that. And Psalm 128, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who walks in his way. His children will be blessed. If we've grown up in a family that's taught us to love the Word of God, to know God, to know what worship is, what a shame to discard that heritage and live as if we haven't received it. Well, and if we can appeal to the men who may be uh, listening with us here today, God has given us a unique responsibility as the head of our homes uh, 
you know, Ephesians 5.23 says that Christ is the, the Savior of the church, head of the church. He's the Savior of the body, and he gives man the responsibility to be the leader of the home and to lead home, one's home to heaven. I, I can't imagine any man saying to his wife and his children, I know that you need me to go to heaven, and more than likely, you're not going to be saved without me. But if you're going to go to heaven, you're going to have to go to a, alone. You're going to have to make it without me. I can't imagine any man saying that to his family. And sometimes we talk about unfortunate children, and by that we mean those who are not properly clothed and fed, who grow up in a home without a mom and dad, but the most unfortunate children in the world are those who grow up in a home without God and Christ. And it's amazing the difference that one family member can make. Maybe it's a wife with her godly example, or even a child or a, a, a father, but if we need to obey the gospel, we should do it for ourselves, but also for our families. Okay, so we've got our families. Anything else that you would say as our time gets away from us, a heal that God's put in place to keep us from being lost? All of these are important, but none more important than this one. God has placed His wonderful love as a heal between us and being lost. You know, it's hard to adequately describe the love of God. It's so deep you can bathe in it. It's so warm it'll transform you. It's so high it'll lead you all the way to heaven. And, and of all the ways we could illustrate it, perhaps the best way we could illustrate it is with Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, when God asked him to give his only son, Isaac, his son of promise, and he stays his hand. But you can imagine that process, him going and maybe having to have that conversation and saying, son, you're the sacrifice. God's asked me to give you up. And, and Jesus there, the pre-incarnate, before he comes in the flesh, uh, son of God, watching this, knowing that someday another father is going to allow his only son to die on that same place for the sins of humanity. When we are confronted with God's great love, we come to realize how much God loves us. You know, it seems to me that there are those out there who because of what Scripture says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, or perhaps those who have already climbed over all of those hills are in the process. But God would appeal to us. He would urge us to see all the ways, all the things that He has put in place to keep us from being lost. You know, sometimes there's a time to think. We need to deliberate. But sometimes there's a time to act. And if we find ourselves in a way that the Bible describes as lost, separated from His grace and His salvation, what God wants us to do is to climb over any barrier that's keeping us from Him and to realize the barriers He's put between us and being lost. Thank you for watching Light of the World today. We hope as we've discussed these heels, these barriers God's put between us and being lost, you've come to see and appreciate how much God wants every one of us to be saved. If you have any questions or comments about today's lesson, we welcome your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. Email us at lightoftheworldbgky at gmail.com or feel free to give us a call anytime at 270-843-8435. We'd love for you to come and visit with us in person at the Lehman Avenue Church of Christ at your earliest convenience. While we don't have all the answers, we believe that God does and we want to serve as one of those hills at your local church to help you go to heaven. We look forward to having you join us right here next week on WNKY at 6.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. as we continue to study God's Word together and continue to look to Him as our ultimate source of light. The Bible says God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Let's all continue to keep looking to the light.